We're going to have Vlad Tanov, CEO of Robin Hood, and we all know how I feel about him. I think he's a rat and a liar. He's played along in this little game on, on social media. He tweeted at me, and he's coming on. And I will say I respect when people come on, but I don't think he has much of a choice unless he's just going to be like pull a Bryce Hall, be like, got you, I'm not really coming on. Um, we got him, Dave. So he's on. So Vlad is in the waiting room. I can't believe it's happening. I think it's gonna. He's gonna try to be cutesy. I'm gonna try to get the real answers. We'll see how it goes. Bring him in. Vlad with the Lakers. What does that say? The Lakers hat. It says it says Taco Tuesday. Taco uh, Tuesday. Actually. Okay, Vlad. You know everybody here is watching this. Hates your guts, right? That's what I hear. Um, but look, uh, I'm glad to be on your show, and uh, hopefully we can get into it and, and answer a lot of these questions. Okay, so I, let, let's start with the number one issue question in flip flop that I think everybody started with, and let and I'll preface it like I'm a real I'm a retail trader. Like I know probably as much as most of the retail guys, the ins out, but we wake up. I put in money on the day that you, you stopped the trading. Um, a lot of people did. And then we find out basically this chaos leading up to the first time we hear from you on CNBC. And you very clearly say it's not a liquidity issue. And then as things continue, it seems to be a liquidity issue. And I'll show you. I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to be very clear. And then you went on Congress, obviously. But I'm going to show you this clip. And this is how we do it here. Let's see. You can watch it. Let me uh, put up the volume because we don't have the greatest technology. It sounds to me, though, that you're suggesting that there was a liquidity problem uh, inside the firm. And, and my question about that then raises all sorts of new questions about whether there's a systemic issue uh, underneath the system and underneath the company unto itself. No, no there, there was no li liquidity problem. And to be clear, this was done preemptively three days later basically as a broker as a clearing broker you have to put up money to the nscc they give us a file for the deposit and the, the request was around three million dollars and just to give context you know robin hood up until that point was raised uh you know a little bit around two million dollars in total uh venture capital up until now so it's a big number like three million dollars is uh, is a large number. Okay, so that's the first. To me, that seems like a clear 180. Do you not view that as a 180? And what is the real answer? I, I don't, um, and let me explain why. Um, I think boiling it down to, uh, to, to a liquidity issue both oversells it and undersells it in a way simultaneously it undersells it because this is really more of a systemic issue, right? Every broker, uh, most brokers restricted trading in these stocks to some degree or another, um, ranging from increasing the margin that you had to use, uh, increasing the margin requirements, all the way through to uh, marking the stocks themselves, position closing only. So this, this, actually, uh, this actually showed a deep, systemic vulnerability in the financial system. It wasn't just a Robinhood unique issue. Robinhood was getting the disproportionate amount of the growth and a lot of the activity was happening on our platform. So certainly we were a part of it. Um, but I think just, just chalking it up. So to if you, had, if you had though the three, so if you had $3 billion sitting in the bank, would you, would you have still acted the same way? Well, I mean, here, here's the thing. Um, I think it, it's hard for me to speculate what would have happened if we had $3 billion or $10 billion in the bank. Um, I think liquidity this, this issue is, and financial... Clarify, this is like a margin issue. Essentially, for like me, it's like if you trade on margin and, I, and, I, and the stocks go down, I get called on it the next day. I have to produce money to whatever account I'm using. That's sort of what this is, right? Well, let me let me tell you, um, if helpful, I can give you sort of like the full context of the, the several days leading up to, to what happened. Right. Because um, it wasn't just I mean, obviously, Thursday, January 28th was when we marked the, the securities PCO. 
but this was sort of an escalating thing leading up to it, right? Uh, so the first step uh, that a lot of brokers took uh, a couple of days before, and, and Robinhood's no exception, was to actually set the margin requirement to 100%. What that means, you can't buy these stocks right. on margin. You have to you have to use cash, and uh, they have to be fully paid for. Then basically, and, and look, the context of this also was Robinhood was was having incredible growth. And I said we were number one on the app store. It's not, I wasn't saying that to brag. It was just the brokerage hasn't been number one on the app store. And it's like real, it's real stress, right? You're growing, you're getting a lot of customers, people are moving money in. And if you remember March of 2020, which was kind of our previous it, it, large crisis. I, I think it's so much talking that gets people frustrated, even when you go back and forth. If, if you don't get a call at three in the morning, do you do you regulate trading? Well, no, we we did this because we had to comply with our our capital requirements. But well, you found that time. out at like three in the morning. If we had, right? if we had a bunch more headroom, uh, yes, we we probably would have let things continue. And look, well, if you didn't get a call that says, "Hey, we need this money from you," you wouldn't have shut off buying. Correct. I mean, the last thing we would want to do is shut off buying. Like Robin, but that is a capital out. issue. They specifically said a liquidity issue. You need this much money. You didn't have it, so you you acted. Isn't that the essence of liquid? Like, am, are you afraid to say liquidity because that creates like a domino effect with the banks? Um, I think I think that liquidity issue, uh, and I probably should be careful and call it the L word, right? The L word is a big thing in financial services. Basically, if you say uh, liquidity issue means you can't meet your capital requirements or your deposit requirements and you're essentially dead. And that was not the case with Robinhood. We met our capital requirements, we met our deposit requirements. Um, but and we were able to- That, that, that the theoretically could be a technicality, right? If you didn't change the trading of that day, you may have had a liquidity issue tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think if we didn't act, uh, we very likely could have faced the liquidity issue in the future. So we had to act. And that's why I said we had to act to protect the firm and our customers, because if the firm can, I mean, if, if the firm can continue to serve our customers, that's a much worse situation. So it's, you know, so why, are, why, why didn't you say that clearly? Like, obviously, you met that first, yeah. that first requirement, and, but if you didn't stop the trading of a way, and well, that leads to the next question, which I'm sure you know is coming. And I've heard your answer to it, and I don't think it jives with anybody, but a liquidity sure. issue was knocking on the door. Yeah, we had to we had to act to make sure we prevented a liquidity issue in the future. And when uh, we say future, the like day. the next day. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Okay, so to me that is very much a liquidity issue. It also the fact that it seemed like you were clear like, "Oh, how can you say it's liquidity?" and then you were mentioning the capital, everyone's like, "What is this guy talking about?" Also, well, I think I think what you're saying is fair, right? And I'll, I'll take it. I, I was kind of running on fumes on Thursday, like trying to raise the $3.4 billion so that we could unrestrict the stocks. We were dealing with the growth and making sure our systems were reliable, which was our previous problem. So there, there's a lot going on. And, you know, I'll take... I'll take the feedback that I could have been a little bit more clear in the short form interviews. I think it's not my ideal format. I'd much rather have a conversation where we can actually go into detail. And I think, you know, I've, I've gone through this sort of ad nauseum with my written congressional testimony where you can see play by play 3 a.m. Well, even when Maxine happened. Water, like Maxine Waters, like chewed you up and all, and I'm sure you've seen it, but you know, to put it again, she made you look like you were just afraid to answer a question. Well, that would be a uh, lot. I think, I, think, I think the yes or no questions are are kind of tough in this forum. Like the answer, as as I mentioned, is a little bit nuanced. But, uh, it, 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 what? Chairwoman Waters, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. But it sounded like you were lawyering up. And for whatever reason... Like you had, like to me, we just, you just said, yes, we have a liquidity issue, which I, I'm not sure you've actually said before, but 
If well, I said no. Well, we didn't we, have it on Tuesday, but we well, may have we it on aware. Wednesday. That's I said like actually Tuesday. we didn't, and we prevented it. We could have had one in the future, potentially, if we didn't act. Okay, fair. That's a fair point. But then the way you acted, in which I think this is the biggest problem, and I've heard you say other firms, Robin Hood clearly, they're marketing everything about them. We're going, we're democratizing trading, we're for the retail trader, all that. That's the branding of Robin Hood, and it clearly worked. And you actually DM'd me. You're like, I'm surprised you don't have Robin Hood. I happen to already be on E-Trade, but before I didn't like you guys, I was like, yeah, Robin Hood, people are like viewing me as a Robin Hood guy. So yeah. knowing that, when you don't, when you force people to sell, you only allow them to sell, but they can't buy. You cratered the stock. Like that was the decision that cratered the stock. And I saw your quote. People get pissed off if they are holding stock and they can't sell it, which yeah. I guess is true. But I guarantee you, if you polled your customer base and said, listen, we're going to just freeze it. Like when the market is tumultuous, they freeze stocks. You can't buy or sell. It's just frozen at that value. And you have your client base all buying it, they would have rather said, freeze it. We want to be able to just figure out what your issues are, liquidity, whatever they may be, figure it out, and then turn it back on and let me buy and sell. But you, and when I say you, Robinhood, manipulated that stock price. You cratered it. And a lot of these people out there, everyday traders who have jobs and normal people, if you weren't watching the stock market and you blinked for 20 minutes, yeah, you could sell it, but you lost like 70, 80% of the value. So how do you rationalize not freezing it? I think that's the number one thing I get. Why didn't you just freeze yeah. it instead of do one? And basically, you, you cratered the market. Well, first of all, let me say that we're speculating now, right? Oh. Saying like what would have happened if Robinhood did something different. It's kind of in the realm of speculation. I, under I understand, by the way, I get that people but, are frustrated. Well, there's, there's no speculation that when you only allow somebody to sell a stock and not buy it, you crater. You don't, that's I think, not speculation. Well, let, me, let me explain the reason why that's kind of standard procedure. Number one, um, has that been, was the, have you done that before? Standard procedure? Well, P PCOing, uh, marking a stock position closing only is a standard procedure. And it's it's what the other brokers did in this case as well. So all brokers that actually went to it's kind of the not everybody the does, not not situation, right? There's escalating things you do, starting with the margin requirements. Then you do. But the not option. everybody did that. Like I could still buy on mine. Yeah, not, not everyone did it, but the ones that did, the ones that restricted buying didn't also restrict selling. And it, it actually comes from the capital requirements. The deposit requirements are driven, the VAR formula was in this case driven by the one-sided long position. So it actually wouldn't help us, wouldn't help the deposit requirements to, um, to, to allow uh, to unrestrict, to restrict selling in this case. So, I mean, if we're if we're managing risk, um, it doesn't help you to um, to to restrict selling as well. Not to mention the fact that you're. You mean if you froze it? Wait, if you froze if you froze both, you're saying that one that what that that wouldn't have gotten you out of? Couldn't you have raised money and froze both? I mean, I think we're we're speculating a little bit here, but there On are two things. There are two things. One. Um, one is this is a standard procedure. You you just don't you don't you don't prevent people from selling unless you absolutely have to. I'm not sure of, of that. But being there was not there was nothing standard about this. I, I you don't you don't restrict free. Nobody remembered being restricted from buying. People veterans were in the stock market didn't. That that's not right. like a normal thing. Restricting restricting selling wouldn't help the the exponential growth in the deposit requirements. And you have the situation, you know, as bad as this was for customers, you'll have other customers who are like, I wanted to sell my stock. Why aren't you letting me sell my stock? Well, but but right. that that that's the part I, I, I don't buy with. Like if if a stock is volatile, just any stock, the stock market freezes it. You can't buy or sell for a, a period of time till it kind of stable. That 
that seems those are, like those are exchange halts, which happen for for very different reasons. But no one ever complains in that case. Hey, I couldn't sell it. Like so, there there is some present. Like it, again, if you tell me, hey, I can't sell my stock for six hours, but when you turn it back on, it's still going to be at the same price. Or Robinhood's sure. going to crater it. I can sell it at twenty percent of what I had. That's essentially what happened. And going back and forth, I'm a little lost. I still, ha- I still don't feel like I got a straight answer why you didn't do both, except you're because, saying the standard procedure. Because the 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 VAR charge, which drives our deposit requirements, was driven by the size of the long position. So uh, if the long position kept growing, or right, so you freeze it, and it's, 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 you freeze it, you freeze it, and it doesn't go up anymore. You freeze both. And then you get people that can't sell their long positions and are extremely upset. But your customers, though, are all buying it. There, were, how many people are trying to sell it at this point? Well, I mean, that's another misconception. If you look back at retail data, um, and there were CNBC reported on this at the beginning of that week, actually Monday through Wednesday, retail customers were actually net sellers of these stocks. Right. So, yeah, some some people were buying, but they were largely buying from other retail customers. So there were a lot of a lot of retail were selling just as well. And well, people get incredibly upset I mean, when they can't sell the stocks that they're holding. It's like so you're, you're your st- contention. What what percentage of people? I mean, I, I, I flat reject this theory. That's why people are so mad. But you're you're sitting here and saying to me that more people are trying to sell. GameStop and AMC, then well, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is if you look at retail trading Monday through Wednesday, uh, according to CNBC, and they have the data from, from all the market makers who collect it, retail were net sellers uh, of, of these stocks Monday through Wednesday. So who is buying it? Institution. Apparently. This seems wildly inaccurate. Like one of those things that I, I don't have facts, but I just can't believe that that that's true. I just absolutely cannot believe that the re, the retail, this is a viral internet sensation that was going up, up, up. I, I, like you had, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry walking down the street who never trade stocks joining Robin Hood to buy these stocks. Yeah, look, I get it. We We didn't want to do this. We had to act uh, very quickly to make sure that this didn't become a bigger problem. Everything Robinhood stands for is letting people trade and giving people access. And we is raised- that why you're here, by the way? That, that, was the only, that was the only reason I could think that you would come on this is because I'm kind of viewed as a retail guy, DDTG, and people have lost faith in Robinhood. Because the other part of this, obviously- is when you froze it, when you froze buying, and I believe once you did that, it cratered the stock, the hedge funds and the institutions could still trade. So they're looking at what Robinhood did and like, well, there's only one thing that can happen here. This stock's going down in whether it be covering a short, whether it be doing the people who on Wall Street, the suits, it's like we just sat there and we have the green hammer. We just take it in the head with nothing to do. And the guy, the firm that's supposed to have our back is essentially the one who put us in this mess. Look, I mean, we, again, I'll just say the last thing I want to do is create this problem for our customers where they want to buy something and they can't, right? So I'm going to do everything I can to make sure we don't see this happen again. Uh, we we believe people should be able to trade what they want. And that's the whole reason we exist. It's the whole reason we brought zero commissions to this market with no account minimums. So I raised $3.4 billion with the team in 72 hours, which I, I don't know if it's been done before. I mean, it's very, very hard to do. People kind of mention that as, oh, they they did that. They should have been able to do more. But it took a lot of work. And we were on the phones working day in and day out, like not sleeping, making sure that we could solve this problem. And now I'm actually working to solve it systemically because I know it's simple to say, oh, you know, like 
Robin Hood should have had more money or, you know, all this could have happened. Robin Hood can raise $3.4 billion in 72 hours. Think about other startups that are in this situation that don't have that ability. I think we actually have to improve um, what that? We have to improve the underlying system so that it's less complicated and these things don't happen again. And I'm so working we, to do that as well. So and it is a ton of money to raise, but again, to me, that that just means we could have halted trading till you raised the money to to satisfy the requirement. Does is this something in hindsight you should have seen coming? Well, it, it was tough, right? We were seeing something happening, obviously, with, with everything going on in Reddit. That's why we uh, increased the margin requirements at 100%. Um, but I think the something going viral, this is kind of the first case something going viral uh, on social media has, has transplanted over to the financial system. So you saw exponential growth in the financial system. And the thing with exponential growth is, it feels very slow until like all of a sudden it just goes haywire. So you've heard me say it's a five sigma event, a five sigma event. And this isn't Robinhood data. It's industry data means it happens one week out of every 3.5 million weeks. So nobody really models for that. And I think we're going to model for that now. Like it's part of our risk management procedures and our standard operating procedures. But a one in 3.5 million event basically means it should never happen. Like there's, but there hasn't been got, that many weeks in the history of the market. But when you got a call at like 3 a.m., were you like, oh my God, this is stunning? Or because it was yeah. building. Like, I mean, I put my money in. And again, that, that I, I show the, the rage kind of a lot of people. I put the money in the day before you halted. It's like, I didn't even know you could halt like the way you did. But it had re like I had seen it building, building, building. And like, I believe in the internet. I believe in the virality of it. So I'm going to jump on this train. I didn't know you could trade the rules. So I knew the thing was exploding. Were you totally caught off guard by the 3 a.m. call? I mean, yeah, I think that call surprised a lot of people. And it was it was stressful, right? Working through this issue, definitely stressful. And um, our deposit requirement for Robinhood Securities went up tenfold in two days. So between Monday and Wednesday, um, it went up tenfold. Um, and that but, actually you shouldn't, the you, shouldn't you have been on the phone? Like when Elon Musk starts talking about it, there was no preemptive. You said at one point we, we did this pre proactively. Like at that point, you've been like, we're running into something major here. Um, you know, I think counterfactually, I, we're definitely going to review everything that we could have done. Uh, leading up to this and see what we could have done better. Um, I think there are certainly things that we could have done better. Um, and what about, it, it started out with the communications uh, to customers. Well, I yeah, think on Tuesday, we sent some emails that were like, hey, there's some market volatility going on. And we basically sent a link that said, what is market volatility? I think in that one, um, in hindsight, we should have said, hey, some things could happen that restrict certain aspects of, of your trading. That would have been that would have at least sort of prepared people that this is a possibility. So I think there's a lot of things we could improve on, but um, I'm proud of the way the team handled the crisis. By and large, we were able to protect the firm. We were able to prevent customers um, from having a bigger. How issue. can you that that's the part? How can you in, in that line you just said like proud of how we handled it? How can that be possible? Like you guys are build as a firm to retail traders yeah, and, and you screwed them over. I mean, so how you, you protected the firm. That's what you did. And that's what it seems every decision was made to protect Robin hood, but everything that you built up as this image of catering. I mean, you literally, if yeah. you really want to protect the firm and protect, I mean, protect the customers, you wouldn't have stopped buying. It's that, that decision basically, had to crater the price and left a ton of your customers holding the bag. I, I understand how, how you feel that way and how customers might feel that way. But I think we have to also protect, I mean, customers buying meme stocks rests on a foundation of our business being able to operate. 
which rests on a foundation of the financial system working, right? If the financial system breaks down, um, things could go well, south. It, really, it, really, really and I don't want to keep going circles, but if it, it wouldn't have broken down if you just held, if you froze it. Well, well, well I mean, I would, I would point you to um, interactive brokers. Uh, uh, Thomas Petterfee did an interview a couple of days ago where he actually outlined a series of steps that if, if like things had gone uh, a, a particular way, we could have had a much bigger systemic crisis. And that's what I want to reiterate. This wasn't like a Robin Hood idiosyncratic issue. This was a but it, but Robin Hood is the, is the company and the, the system that has proactively marketed themselves a very specific way to a very specific clientele and then turn their back on that clientele. So I completely agree, but we also have to play play by the rules, right? But you it's could have like, played by the rules by freezing both. That's within the rules, no? I I'm not sure. I mean that um, we we can look into that, but it wouldn't be standard, and it wouldn't have. There's solved nothing the standard about this. That's true. So that that's it. And then moving on a little bit, and, and I almost wasn't even going to get into this because I know the answers, and I've heard it all, and there's no way. Sure. But from an outsider perspective and somebody who's like, it's always the suit sticking it to the little guy. It's always the hedge yeah. funds sticking it to the little guy. The overwhelming feeling I had and a lot of traders have is for the first time in a long time, the little guy, whether it be, you know, Roaring Kitty or whoever it may be, we had the upper hand. We're making money and the shorts are getting killed and suddenly – Somebody pressed the pause. It's like we're winning. It's the fourth quarter. The Harlem Globetrotters are finally going to lose to the Washington Generals. And then the rules yeah. change. And it seemed the people who changed the rules were you guys. And when you look at it, the relationship you guys have with the Citadel and Melvin Capital, anybody with logic would be like, something happened here. Whether Vlad was leaned on, whether calls were placed, because billionaires were about to lose their firm unless this happened. There's yeah, no proof I, of it, but anybody <laughs> looking at the way Wall Street works over the history of time would be like, hmm, this doesn't smell good. I, I actually think I'm glad you brought it up because um, that's what I was out there predominantly trying to address on Thursday there's no collusion between Robinhood and any hedge fund or any market maker. We have no, I, we have no relationship with Melvin Capital. I never even heard of them until Monday. Citadel Execution Services, which is different than Citadel, the hedge fund, executes our orders. And I think you saw um, both Ken Griffin and myself uh, in the congressional hearing state unequivocally that this was like they had nothing to do with this decision. So I actually think, you know, for perpetuating that misinformation of collusion, um, you were you were wrong to do that. And I, I think it was irresponsible. And I'm sorry to say it, but no, you like, don't have to be sorry. Wondering. You wouldn't have to be sorry. But I mean, the, the facts are if there was collusion or there was something going on, I certainly wouldn't expect people to admit it readily. So, I mean, I've heard people be like, no, we didn't do anything. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I don't think anybody's ever been convicted of a crime the first time. Like you did it, they're like yeah, I did. So I mean, I, I, so he said, she said. There's no proof of it. Well, I, it's, I think well, it's a it's a big claim. We're in a super highly regulated industry, right? And if you think about it from my perspective, what does that mean? Super regulated. That, super right? regulated. There's, there's been all sorts of scandals on Wall Street. That's true. Yeah, and. My business is all about giving the little guy access to to trade, right? So why would I hurt my own business? And you know, that's rest one of the sure. great questions I asked because if I I I sat, I looked back, I said, "Geez, when Vlad said we're not going to let people buy, but we're going to force them to sell, he has to know he is ruining his brand's reputation. So there has to be a reason. It has to be a big one why he's willing to tank what he's built." Yeah. You know, when Wednesday, um, you know, Wednesday before this all went down, the story was retail investors finally uh, have a leg up on yep. the hedge funds and in, in the institutions. And they're using they're using this app Robinhood to do it. And I agree. That's a great story. Um, and, you know, we, we support the little guy. We're, we're all about that. So um, 
hopefully you can understand that we wouldn't we wouldn't have done this unless we actually had to for risk management and to prevent uh, a larger problem. And it was a systemic problem. Lots of people restricted buying. I, or, but or but you understand the number one thing that people generally ask and say, and it's going in a circle, which, and I don't want to go too long. What you just said is true. You yep. had to, I, I believe that you had the, even though you set it off the other way by being like, it wasn't a liquidity issue, but, if you just did, if you didn't, if you just held it and didn't allow buying and selling, that would seem like you had the interest of the little guy because you did something and gave a huge advantage to the big guy. That is the exact opposite of helping the little guy. You killed the little guy. Look, all I can say is we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, I tell you that I'm working on it. We raised the 3.4 billion, which goes a long way. Um, and we're going to make sure that uh, we're better about this and we serve our customers when they need us to, right? Um, so so what, I'll leave you with this. I appreciate you coming on. Robin Hood's future. I'm on the record. I, I, I don't think you can come back from this um, because I, as a trader, I, I don't, I think if push comes to shove and there's another major incident, you're not going to have my back. That's how I feel. You're going to do the firm first, and, and if it screws me over, it screws me over. Where do you feel? And I, I'm sure you're going to say good, but I'm sure you're on here because you know there's trust issues. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. So so how do you, like, do you okay. ever think, like, let me look at the customers, like, who lost a ton of money? Like, what can we do to make it right by them? Yeah, I mean, I think on a, if, if we break it down step by step, right, Step one, uh, I understand that marking a stock PCO is not a great experience. And you saw that on Friday, we we came up with a better solution. We had position limits. Now, granted, they were, they were low uh, because we needed the capital to come in so that we could relax them. But Monday of next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, you saw them kind of increase to pretty high levels. And then we were able to remove the limits. So we already have the infrastructure to deal with the problem uh, much better than just marking it blanket PCO. Number two, the, the capital coming in, I think helped a lot, right? It's 3.4 billion is more than we'd raised in the history of Robinhood up until that point. Number three, I think there's an, a systemic issue with the plumbing behind all these transactions. And we don't have to get into the technicals about that, but um, we're working to solve that. and. I think if there's one really good thing, it's that everyone's embraced that problem, right? You saw Congress, you see a lot of the financial industry veterans, a lot of the startups, both on kind of traditional finance and crypto. They're like, this is crazy. Why are we not settling trades in real time? Why do you have to like put up money from your corporate cash to, to pay for trades when a customer has money in their account that they should be able to use to pay for those trades? So there, there's a lot of um, confusing things about how the system works that I think there's now a lot of impetus to, to actually resolve. And I think I'll, I'll have, I'm glad to have some role in fixing that. And I think, I, I hear that we could communicate a lot better, that I could do a lot better personally. And maybe you're seeing that improve over the past couple of weeks uh, from my interviews on Thursday. But I think there's a reason why financial industry companies haven't been very transparent. And I do think that I have an opportunity to change that. And right, but you, you guys theoretically weren't. Uh, who knows? It'll be interesting. I, I don't disagree that change will have to happen. I agree that it has to. But oh, I, I think we'll see change very, very quickly, systemic change. Uh, and um, I, I haven't seen this sort of enthusiasm around lowering settlement times Um ever before. I mean, I, I think I think you'll see a groundswell. You're seeing T plus two memes. There's memes on the internet about the settlement period and how uh, slow it is. So I, I get all that. But a lot of it is jargon, and I don't mean that negatively, but it, it like for the, the retail trader, some more knowledgeable than others, like I get even lost on some of that. But when I look as we move forward to who I'm going to do business with, it's like, who, if something happens unforeseen, is going to be like customer one? Like, how do I protect my, because we have money with you. You clearly, in this past case, customer wasn't one. Robinhood Vlad was one. 
customer, I don't know, was eight. Well, I, I think we can debate that a little bit, right? If Robinhood ceases to exist, our customers would be in a much worse spot than, than if we didn't. So we did believe that by protecting the firm and protecting the system, ultimately uh, we had to do the best thing. That was the best thing for customers. Um, so hopefully you understand my perspective on that one, right? I'm not going to like violate my regulatory requirements and risk a bigger issue, um, even though obviously I want people to keep trading what they what they want to trade. But we have to follow a very strict set of rules. We can ask for those rules to evolve and to be changed and make that happen. But well, you still could have met all those violation of my of the. You could have met all. You could have met all those by holding it and not giving the advantage to the big guy, which is what happened. Anyway, this is going on. I do appreciate you coming on. I didn't think you would. I didn't know what you're doing on the initial tweet. So I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. I hope you appreciate I wore this hat because you made fun of my haircut. You're, well, Vlad, your hair, it looks normal here. It looked like you took a, you scalped somebody, you took a wig and put it on. I mean, it was a ridiculous look. <laughs> I'll take it. Hey, I really appreciate what you're doing for small businesses, by the way. And before before we had this this uh, this little tiff, um, I was. Did you know I was killing fan, you the whole time? Fan of your show. Did you know I was killing you the whole time? What do you mean? Like just roasting you? Where you're like, oh, this guy's just all over my ass. <laughs> or are you too busy and other stuff? Well, you know, I, I watched some of the clips on the internet uh, for sure. I, you saw that I, I saw the ones this morning. Um, yeah. But yeah, before um, before this happened, um, I was a big fan of, of your show. And I remember this segment you did um, on Fox Business on it was during the summer. It was like um, the, the retail trader of America. I forget who it was. And yeah. I, I thought that was a pretty good segment yeah. where you guys. But, but today, but today is a good example. Not I don't want to keep going, but today that feeling, everyone's getting murdered. It's like why don't we let, let, let's pause it? I, I guess not. No one pauses it when we when we're uh, losing. They only do when we're winning. So that's a real vibe. And obviously, I know it wasn't. But that that sentiment is a big problem, and general mistrust. And unfortunately for your right now. That sense of mistrust, Robin Hood's right in the middle of it. Well, we're going to keep being out there, trying to make things better, improving uh, how we communicate to, to you guys and our customers. And you have uh, you have my word on that, that we're only going to keep getting better and better. And I do see the mistrust as, as a big problem. It's one of the reasons why Robin Hood is doing what we're doing, why Robin Hood exists. People felt that mistrust and they, they view us as for the little guy um, helping. It's like the Vince helping. McMahon gif. You took the thing off, and it's like you're exactly who we thought we were. You're selling the info to the trade. All right. We, we could go on for I don't even know what time is. I feel, oh, it's not that bad. 38. I thought we were a lot longer. So I appreciate it, Vlad. I'm not going to say good luck because I'm not wishing you good luck, but I appreciate cool. you coming on. I appreciate you having me. All right. Take care. Take Thank care. you. Take care. See ya.